I have a question regarding the first initial batches that the Minister of Justice submitted. When exactly did you submit? I need the exact date that the first batches were submitted. And also, uh, some, I'm still in speaking with some, min some justice workers, some in immigration, some in police. They still haven't received their placement. Some, there's still a few that haven't received their placement letters as yet. Can you give me a summary of how many are still in the process of receiving their placement um, letters and when would that be finalized? And I have one question, the staff that's involved with going over the 25 batches per week, are they staff that are part of your cabinet or is there staff that is outside of the cabinet? I'm asking for continuity sake. The 19th of February is when the first batch was sent to the Ministry of Finance. Okay, according to my SG, it was the 19th of February that first batch was sent. And secondly, oh, that's a resubmitted. No, the first batch she's asking, the 200. January what? The 24th of January is what I'm being advised, was the first day that those were sent. Um, yeah. And the second question is you're asking if members of the cabinet are a part of that group? Sorry, Madam Chair, lady through you. I will allow the Speaking MP to yes, ask the oh. question again. Yes, no. so that the, you got it, Minister? I have it, I have okay. it. Okay, thank you, In MP, with Minister. some justice workers, they still haven't received their placement letters. Um, we have staff within the Ministry of Justice who have moved from one department to the other. So let's say, for example, if you were working at the prison and you requested to move because you're no longer happy with working in that environment and you were moved to the immigration department, we first have to be able to rectify your history at the prison, which is a project that is currently underway, so that individual is not able to receive a placement letter at this time. Why? If we were to issue a placement letter to that individual, their placement would be at the prison, and that is something that they don't want. What they're seeking is to be placed in immigration. So we have some individuals, indeed, that are still awaiting that, and we're asking them to have some patience so that we can be able to rectify it, so we can make sure that the placement letter they receive is for the department they want to be at. Um, and thirdly, the staff, no, the, the, the staff that are, as far as I know, none of the members of my cabinet are a part of the first batches. As a matter of fact, um, there was even a request to, re, how you say, separate the batches per agency and handle a specific department first. These batches are going randomly to ensure that all departments persons within all departments are a part of the batches that are going up. So we are not um, separating them and no one from my cabinet, as far as I know, I only have two persons who was a part of our civil servants that um, are in my cabinet and as far as I know, none of them are a part of the initial batches. LB discussion, I get that. I want to talk money. That's what I want to talk. And the reason why I want to have that discussion, Madam Chair Lady, is because I want to ask the Honorable Minister about the crime fund. Is it anywhere in the future are we looking to take this responsibility away from the OM? And here's the reason why I'm saying that. I was shocked with a publication that I've seen from the OM, that came out from the OM, about a separate account that is used, that is banked at Banco de Carib for fines that doesn't go in the government coffers. I don't know if you're aware of that, but going through the budget, I was shocked when I saw it there, that there's a separate account that is used for fines that goes to or is deposited at Banco de Carib. I would like to know why it is we are not able to use both crime fund and this account to pay the necessary funds to the individuals, which is the police officers and the whole staff that is needing this money. Why can't we access this money? In addition to that, Madam Chair, I know my time is up. Can we get a breakdown of that separate account that's at Banco de Caribe that is used for fines? I thank you very much. The impression that money is the issue is the wrong one. The issue here is not that the money is not available to pay the justice workers, and that is why it's necessary to take it out of the crime fund. That's one. But secondly, the crime fund in itself is currently um, one of the items under the Lance Paquet, and it has its own legislation as to what you can and cannot use the crime fund for. 
This is not one of them. This is not one of them that you can use the crime fund monies for. So we have to be careful with the impression of giving that there is monies available and there's this, this, there's no will to pay the justice workers. That is not correct. So when, when yes, it, it, it is what I understood you asked, but you can get the clarification. Secondly, your question also asks about being able to get clarification about the second account that the OM's office has. I would have to seek that information for you to be able to provide it. But I just wanted to answer your two-prong uh, question through you, Madam Chair Lady, to MP. If Madam Chair Lady, through you, I ask the following questions to the minister. Um, the, current, the current budget for the personnel expenses in justice is estimated at 51 million guilders, and this is based on the 2023 budget. Can you, Minister, um, give us an idea of what will actually happen once everyone is placed? How much will this increase by 20, 30, 40, 50% after all the justice workers are actually um, in their correct scale and place? The second question, um, what legal basis um, exists for the signing of the LB if funding has not been secured to cover the costs? What plans does the government have to sustain both the increase in cost of personnel as was before by my colleague on the top of the retroactive payment, which are currently estimated at 4 million guilders per year on average, a total of 40,000. MP, 40, 000, MP Lacruz, I just 40 need million. to let you know that you only have one minute for the question and you're over. The one minute, so if you could just finish, finish out this it, question, please. yep, okay. And we just want to assure that the justice personnel are not being given false hope um, that the country can indeed afford it. The figure that you are referring to is a part of the budget, and you're seeking to know when we did the 2023 budget amendment just here in December. It was a requirement to do the multi-annual budgeting um, in order for His Excellency to have signed the very legal basis you just asked about, the Rexpositi El Beham, the function book, um, as well as the budget itself being a legislation giving that, uh, that legal basis. So all of the foundation necessary, all of the legal basis that is necessary is established to be able to compensate the justice workers. And it was a requisite for us to ensure that the multi-annual budgets going forward also recognize the necessary payment for the justice workers. Um, what was the second question? What legal? So I just answered both questions in terms of um, the multi-annual budget has it, and the legal basis is established in everything that we just signed in December. RBC, we know the roles you have to play can change quickly. Whether it's a homeowner, a new parent, today's head chef, salesperson of the month, or the family chauffeur. Whatever life asks you to be. RBC is a bank for all of you. SFV insured? Do you have a valid medical insurance status? SFV is cardless. Request your My SFV account today and enter the virtual office of SFV. Go to SFV.SX and sign up now. SFV, SFV, yeah. your social health insurance.
welcome all. Thank you very much for uh, being with us. Today we will give a presentation about making the archives of St. Martin accessible. And we uh, are Koen Vergalen from the Radboud University in Nijmegen and Johan Verlangen from the Dutch National Archives. And uh, the last few weeks, the last two weeks, we made a trip through St. Martin, but also to Seba and Stasia in order to uh, explore, as it were, the archival past of the islands. And we did a lot of things, and I think, uh, thanks to the support of the University of St. Martin, we can present our findings tonight, and we are glad that you are here. Um, let's start with a short introduction. Uh, there are two of us. This is Johan van Lang. He's from the National Archives of the Netherlands, program manager International Heritage Corporation. And he's actually a specialist on Suriname, Guyana, but also India and Malaysia. Um, the National Archives are parts of the uh, Ministry of Education, Culture and Science of the Netherlands. But he's also very much involved in the team, uh, us team for uh, Caribbean Archive Cooperation. And he went together uh, with me. And I'm Uwe Gale. I'm actually a historian. Associate Professor at Radboud University in Nijmegen. And I'm also the coordinator or program manager of what we call the historical database of Suriname and the Caribbean. And that's the main reason I'm here. Because the historical database, ADSC, is um, a plan to build a historical database of all the people who lived both in Suriname but also in the former uh, Netherlands and Tilly's until around 1950 based on archival sources and, more important, to make them available. Available not only for specialists, but for everyone. So everyone can search for their own ancestors. How do we do that? And I think that's one thing I really, really love to show. Uh, what we do is we do it together with you. We do, uh, we make uh, rest we restore, but also digitize to scan archives, make them digital. And then we ask volunteers to enter the data online at home from the scans into a database. And we help, of course, we support people in doing this. And at the end, we together, we create a community with people who understand these sources and can use them for themselves. So it's not only about helping us out, it's also about learning about your own history. And we have already published in the past, for example, the slave registers of Suriname and Curaçao, emancipation registers, Curaçao, Aruba, Anastasia, and civil records of Suriname and Curaçao. And already a lot of books have been written about it based on these types of sources. And I think that's the great thing. People really reconnect with their own past. Why are we here on St. Martin? Well, our aim of our visit was threefold. We wanted to make an inventory of all relevant archival records, archival sources, should I say, both within government, but also in private organizations and, for example, church communities, because church books can be very old. Uh, because there was no overview of them. We wanted to understand what it actually is and what the uh, quality of these archival sources. Are they in good state or are they uh, very badly in a very bad state? The second thing was to support organizations in submitting a proposal to the so-called Metamorphose program, which is a sort of system that subsidizes the digitization of archives. This is a way to make them available online for people. And the third one was expanding the historical database of Suriname and the Caribbean's network with stakeholders on St. Martin, St. Eustatius, and Saba, and if possible, to motivate people to participate in this project, transcribing their own heritage. Of course, we, what we do is not totally new. Uh, uh, last year, uh, two years ago already, the National Archives of Aruba wrote a report for the government, the Sip Maarten, about safeguarding, digitizing, and digital accessibility of archival materials of Sip Maarten. But it mainly focused on government archives. 
and working on the governments. We took it sort of broader approach. approach. Um, and I think it's good to know what, what did we actually found. Well, the first thing, and I think we should specifically emphasize this, is that there's far more historical archival material on the islands than everyone expected. Some people, even specialists, said to us, well, why go to St. Martin? There's nothing there anymore, all these hurricanes, etc. And of course, that's not true. People protect their heritage, and sometimes um, on the most unexpected places. Um, for example, this uh, photograph is from a fragment of a bird register from 1816, which, as far as I know, is the oldest uh, governmental bird register on all of the Netherlands Antillen, former Netherlands Antillen. Uh, we looked further, we also looked at uh, non-governmental organizations, we also have beautiful church records on the islands, and also very good uh, notary records. that I worked for 20 years in an archaeological museum and for the last three years while doing this research looking at climate challenges and how that affected people that came to the island. The first people that came to the island it brought perspective change where before I used to see the archaeological record as remnants of past activities but now I see life in the past. So through that perspective change it made me think a bit more about um, how the people lived in the past and how that can contribute towards um, bring a better understanding for us, or helping us to um, deal with the challenges we're going to face in the future. Um, so yeah, my title is Long-Term Evidence for Social Adaptations in Climat to Climatic Challenges. So climatic challenges and change is something very current now, but the climate has always been changing. As we can see from 10,000 years ago, what we call the Holocene, the, area, the region has undergone different periods of drought, wet periods, um, sea level rise, hurricanes, and even tsunamis. So the climate has always been changing and since the first people that came into the region around 7,900 years ago, people had to deal with these challenges and overcome these challenges. Uh, my research is focused on Aruba, but I think it's the case for the whole region that there was always continuation of life in the region. Um, and I think when we look at climatic challenges and the impact of climatic challenges, um, the northern Latin Antilles are the ones that got more impacted through the hurricanes. Um, but still life continued on these islands, even though that they had to undergo through such um, devastating effects. So as I said, my research is focused on Aruba. Um, we're looking at the first people that came on the island, so that's what we call the archaic age. Um, there's the first people arrived on the island around 3,000 years ago, and we see here that there was a concentration of arrivals here, so this is the Spanish Lagoon. Um, who knows Spans Lagoon and Aruba? Have people have been in Aruba? Yeah, okay, so you know. So there's where the, the people arrived. It was a natural inlet to the island, which provided the newcomers with the possibility to not only have access to marine resources, but also to go and um, explore the hinterland. So it was a way that people were able to arrive and go a bit more inland, and did also to have security, their food security, which was the marine resources. Um, Within these sites, as you can see, there's sites were mostly coastal sites, but we have two sites which are inland sites, and this is one I'm doing archaeological research on to understand how people that came on the island, how they, they adapted to their new conditions. Because when they arrived from, because they came from the mainland of Venezuela, which I think is something that we have to think a bit more about the ingenuity and the techn technological ability of these people to go from the mainland of Venezuela 3,000 years ago and to go to Aruba, not once, but several times. I, ha I asked um, this um, um, Roli Beslik, who's a swimmer, and he swam from, the, from Venezuela to Aruba and also kayaks a lot, and he told me that in four hours you can do that. And then I asked him, like, okay, so if you have no GPS and all those, um, 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 if you don't have technology, how, you, how would you do that? And then he told me, like, if there is no way to see the island, he wouldn't be able to know how to do that. So that makes it, made me realize that a lot of times we think of the past um, that people were more primitive, that they were not, they didn't have technological development, they didn't have, they didn't have knowledge, but that's not the case. 
right? So then we have the ceramic period. So is, this is the second group that came to Ruba. It's what we call the Kakitio Indians um, from the Arawak speaking groups. And they settled at more in the inland side. So they had three locations, which were the main sites. Thank you, Flip, Santa Cruz, and Savoneta. But they also exploited the whole island. And these people were the ones that um, also were, com compared to the first group, they were different types of groups because the first groups were what we call hunter and gatherers. But recent research has um, um, showed that they also introduced and cultivated foodstuffs and they also had ceramics. So again, they were more advanced than was thought in the past. So my research objectives is to identify adaptation strategies mitigating the effects of climatic challenges within the archaeological record and to examine how islanders cope with challenges that negatively impacted their water and food resources and influence their settlement location on house structures. So what I'm basically going to do, is, what I'm basically doing is that I'm looking from the ch perspective of climatic challenges, how life was um, continued on the island, because when we see, as you saw from the first two maps, life continued throughout the island. Throughout the time, people always lived on the island and even during um, um, periods of stress, they would go back to the mainland, but they would come back. So that's another aspect of living on the island that nowadays the sea is more like a barrier, but in the past the sea was their highway, so there was always a way to go back to um, their families in the mainland. So my primary research question is which adaptive measures that insular inhabitants take to deal with climatic challenges experienced in the long term. Um, my my research is based on human ecodynamics, which is the perspective that it considers humans as an integral part of the functioning of the natural system. Um, nowadays, we live in a different way, but because we don't really rely on the natural system to live, or to, it's, we're not dependent on the natural system for our survival, but this theoretical framework considers humans as an integral part. Also, it's non-linear, so it's not from one direction to the other, it's multi-linear. This means that both the natural system, um, I use the term natural system because nature is it's not a real term because nature here is not the same in the Netherlands or in the rest of the world, so I use it in a natural system. Um, but So the natural system influences the people and the people influence the natural system and the longer that interaction goes, that's why we call it social natural relations, that the, the, the longer that goes, the more... Um, it affects both sides. So we affect the nature, but the nature also affects us. And the way that we affect the nature is what, how it affects our lives. SV insured? Do you have a valid medical insurance status? SV is cardless. Request your MySV account today and enter the virtual office of SV. Go to SV.SX and sign up now. SV, yeah. your social health insurance At RBC, we know the roles you have to play can change quickly. Whether it's a homeowner, a new parent, Today's head chef, sales person of the month, or the family chauffeur. Whatever life asks you to be. RBC is a bank for all of you.
just up the road from the White River, you'll find the community of Basco Bay, which is the home of Jamaica's third international airport, the Ian Fleming International Airport. It was a historic occasion for the airport and Jamaica in general as American Airlines operated its first passenger-based flight to the airport. The flight took off from MIA, Miami International Airport, minutes after 10 and landed at Ian Fleming close to two hours later. The flight was met at the airport by a warm, caring, cheering Jamaican people, excited to be a part of this day that will no doubt go down in history as the day it first came, which is February 24, 2024. After the arriving passengers left the aircraft, within an hour, a quick turnaround, the aircraft was boarded again with new passengers and left for Miami. Every 